So most of you know, Michael was my dissertation advisor, or as the Germans say, my doctor father, which I would argue makes Bob Friedland my doctor brother. And um, several of the people in this room are Michael's doctor grandchildren. So I think you guys all get to be welcome to a kind of extended family, which um, of Michael's doctor family. Um, it's very diverse. We have one thing in common. We all consider ourselves incredibly lucky to have gotten to work with Michael and that we get to keep exchanging ideas and collaborating with him, even though he's now on an extended sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> but although Michael is my official doctor father, it actually was my real father who got me into sociology because in 1972, he invited Michael over for dinner at our house in Zambia. I was in high school, I think I was 15, and Michael had just started his PhD at the University of Chicago. But uh, Michael is an energizer but funny. So when I met him, he had just published his first book, The Color of Class, and my father made me read it. I often refer to it as Michael's master's thesis, and he always corrects me because actually it was a side gig. It wasn't his master's thesis. I say you were an energizer, buddy, um, as well as a globetrotter and um, a cat herder. <laughs> In the early 1970s, Zambia had just nationalized the copper mines, but it remained dependent on multinational companies to extract the ore using Zambian workers. Michael's study of the underground labor process in the mines is a remarkably prescient and still relevant analysis of how and why Zambian's newly independent state and its political elite allowed the racial hierarchies that have been created under colonialism to persist long after independence and nationalization. I think it might've been the first piece of sociology I ever read, and I still remember sitting in that living room in Zambia being blown away by it. So about a decade later, when I was thinking of going to graduate school, my real father pointed out that if I went to Berkeley, I could work with Michael. So I did, although actually, to be honest, it turned out I'd missed all the deadlines for all other programs, so Berkeley was the only place I applied. <laughs> Worked out. But neither my father nor I realized that by 1981, when I arrived in Berkeley, Michael's attention had gone in a really different direction because he went to study at the University of Chicago and um, met real sociology. <laughs> Um, actually for Michael, William Jules Wilson had started there and became his advisor. So I always thought, Michael, you should have taught William Jules Wilson, or you should have suggested that he titled his book, not the declining significance of race, but the significance of class. It would have been more accurate. Um, but Michael was working on something really different. He had turned his, for his doctorate, he was doing um, a study of a Chicago factory he called manufacturing consent. And by the time I started graduate school in 1981, it was already on its way to becoming a sociological classic, one that has become canonic in labor studies. Um, and I'm sure many of you have read. I may continue to tease him forever about <laughs> racial capitalism in Zambia to looking at workers' consent to exploitation in Chicago. But from there, I have to admit, Michael went on to make many, many more contributions from this extraordinary comparison between apartheid migrant labor system and circular migration into California from Mexico, which I know I've made many of you, um, to his studies of the aftermath of communism in Eastern Europe, to uplifting the extended case method in ethnography, to his remarkable essays on social theorists ranging from Gramsci and Fanon to Polanyi and Bourdieu, and not to mention most recently, his essays exploring and building on Eric Wright's work, including in a new volume which should be out this summer. All of that work, I think, reflects a stance that on Monday, Michael described as critical engagement. He begins by exploring real world experiences and then analyzes the dynamics that shape them and asks what could change. Nowhere, I think, is that side of Michael's intellectual journey more obvious than in his current project, which brings Du Bois' passionate engagement with the real world and his almost utopian faith that sociology can make a difference to the center of the sociological stage. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Michael so we can all hear today's chapter in what I think may be one of your most inspiring projects ever. Perhaps you should give the lecture too. <laughs> I have more jokes. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so it's always a bit um, well, it's a great honor to be introduced by one student, but also you never know what's going to come out of the mouth of students who know more about me than about I do about myself. Um, but anyway, Gay has known me for a long time. Not, she wasn't six years old when she met me, but um, 
But yes, uh, I think you are the only person who I know met W.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, so we've had a long journey together. Yeah. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'd like to start my PowerPoint. Is that on the cards here? Host disabled. So oh, sorry. Hang on a second. To be able to do that. Right. Share. Yes. There we yep. go. That's you. Ah. Seem to maximize. Yes. So, oh, I can't see the value. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's going invisible on yours. You can actually see it on that thing over there. Oh. Oh, there it is. Oh, don't worry. There you go. Sorry. Should have it. But now you can see I was coming ahead. You no one you to see that. I want you to see the first one. Here we go. That's where I want. Yes. Can we get rid of it? Yeah, let's try and get rid of that. Nope. This isn't going very well, folks. I'm very sorry about this. I don't know which button it is. Let me go to display standings up at the top. The problem is it doesn't actually display on the laptop. So I'm... What's it? What are you doing? Tails, tab. I think something's going on. Well, no, don't worry about it. Everybody can see whatever it is. We'll just try it one more time. Well, it also means none of us can read. It's too small. I could do it. <laughs> no, but we can't read the one we're supposed to read. Oh, no it is. <laughs> there, there you go. go. Yeah. 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 You're a genius. I don't know about that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good. So anyway, I just wanted to open today um, with this slide, um, which is from the 1900. World Exposition in Paris, W.E.B. Du Bois was invited, was asked, requested to prevent, prevent at the exposition a, a, a view of African Americans 30 years after emancipation. And he produced these very famous or have become very famous infographics. And he managed to be very artistic about the way he presented it. And it's, in, it's, in, it's now obtainable. I don't think that actually that the originals are obtainable actually on, on, on the web, but there, is a, there, is, there are beautiful books um, which contain the, um, the, 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 the infographics. There are about a hundred of them. And basically what they show, and the infographic, what they show is the progress over those 30 years. Du Bois was trying to demonstrate that African-Americans, despite, despite Jim Crow, despite the failure of, of, of Reconstruction, despite Plessy versus Ferguson of 1897, um, that institutionalized segregation, nonetheless, African-Americans have made substantial progress. And this is one about income and expenditure, um, and there are many others about property, about education, about occupation, and they all show the same sort of trajectory. Um, and what is even more interesting that, that few people haven't recognized and noticed that along with this came 500 curated slides of African-American people and their lives. And what sort of lives? They were bourgeois lives. They are beautifully curated, beautifully presented um, portraits of African-American men, women, and children. He was intent on demonstrating 
the actual progress of African Americans despite the obstacles that they faced. So we don't see in this presentation of African Americans the oppression, the subjugation that they were, that most African Americans were actually experiencing. Du Bois was intent on showing, in, in, in contradicting and denouncing the stereotypes of African Americans as a as a prepped, excluded, marginalized population subject to, and particularly in the rural area, share, sharecropping or discrimination um, in, in, in the towns. Anyway, if you, you, you might want to take a look at those very interesting um, portraits of African Americans at that time. Now, let me say something about what we're supposed to, what I think we should have learned in the last lecture. It's two days ago. First, I want to underline that the movement from public sociology to critical engagement requires understanding of historical context. W.B. Du Bois was very sensitive after he left the university, was very sensitive to political events, particularly as he edited the Crisis magazine. Um, and it's impossible, really, to understand Du Bois's work without understanding the historical context. That is a feature, in my view, of critical engagement, because it is so deeply embedded in the world it is seeking to change. It leads, in my view, to Du Bois's particular vision of sociology, which I described as experiential in the sense that Du Bois did not think of himself once he had left the university, did not think of himself as outside the world he was studying and engaging, but very much part of that world. So his sociology is always experiential. Um, and second, it is also reflexive. He is continually reflecting on his observations, um, his understandings, and how they are continuous with or discontinuous with his previous observations and understandings. He is actually always reconstructing his own past as he engaged in the world. That's the reflexive moment. But that engagement in the world did develop a sociology, a global and historical sociology, the sort of sociology that I will be describing today. And the final feature, the fourth and final feature, is that his sociology had always moral foundations and he never lost sight of the possibility of alternative worlds. He was in very much committed to the idea of a explication of alternatives, utopian alternatives often, but nevertheless never lost hope in the, despite all the despair, never lost hope in an alternative future. So I think, as I said probably last time, appropriate that I should be talking about him here at the Havens Wright Center. Now today, we will see how Du Bois' sociology We'll see how Du Bois' sociology is at work through the concept of racial capitalism, or importantly, what I will call racialized capitalism, for reasons that will become apparent. Yes. Now, we also learned something else last time. Well, I learned something else last time. That is that the idea of traveling theory. Uh, an idea that, that Edward Said developed. The idea that when theory moves from place to place, it gets reconstructed. An obvious point, but a very important point. So I was talking last time about how public sociology, at least the way I understood it, was very much inspired by what I had observed in 1990 the state of South African sociology and the work of Eddie Webster, um, a, a very well-known industrial sociologist in South Africa, labor sociologist. And I was so inspired by that that I thought that I did brought it home. I, 
the, 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 the practice of sociology as I saw it in apartheid South Africa, well, coming to an end, but nevertheless still apartheid South Africa, um, brought it home back to Berkeley, and I sort of tried to think about how that would work in the context of US sociology, which was and still remains hyper-professionalized. But in the process, I constructed a Eric Wright two by two table. Um, at that time, there was no way I could not avoid two by two tables. Um, and I tried to make a universal project out of the idea of public sociology, asking the two questions, knowledge for who, knowledge for what? And that is a tactic and strategy that US sociologists often deploy, making the particular the universal. But actually, the United States is not a universal, it's a very weird country. And so when I take this idea back to South Africa with a two by two table, they don't quite recognize what they're been doing is what I said they were doing. In the beginning, they were happy that I had that I had appropriated their ideas and universalized them, but then they realized that I had actually Americanized them in my universalization. And so there became a struggle, well, struggle, a little debate between myself and them um, in, about whether there is something peculiar to the US is public sociology, that was really defined in relationship to professional sociology as compared and differentiated from the South African critical engagement. And in the end, they convinced me. And then I drew on W.B. Du Bois to illustrate that critical engagement. So there's a story of it traveling backwards and forwards and being reconstructed in the process. The concept of racial capitalism has had a similar fate. Yeah. It was originally, so we are told, I think correctly so, it was originally a South African idea that race and capitalism are inextricable, developed by Neville Alexander um, and Legasic and Hemson. They use the concept of racial capitalism, but racial capitalism, the idea of the inextricability of race and, race and capitalism was part and parcel of in the Marxist historiography that was developing in the 1980s, 90s. Well, 1980s, let's leave it at that, at 80s. Now, there were two dimensions to this Marxist understanding of racial capitalism. There was what I call the class struggle perspective on the relationship between race and capitalism in which race was seen to be the foundation stone of the division within the working class and the, that very division owes as an obstacle to the unification of the working class, a working class that would under other circumstances where there were no divisions, um, build uh, effective class solidarity that could threaten capitalism. But, so that's the class struggle idea, the idea that race impedes the development of, the, of class solidarity within the working class. But there was a second vision of racial capitalism what I call an accumulation perspective, in which the focus was the ways in which in South Africa, the apartheid regime, and before that, the, the regime of segregation, reproduced cheap labor power. That was associated, just as the first one was associated initially, I will associate with Jack Simons, Simons and Simons, a book, Color of Class. The second perspective, the accumulation perspective, associated with the name of Harold Wolpe. And he argued, he argued that what is peculiar to racial capitalism in South Africa was the reproduction of pre-capitalist modes of production alongside capitalist modes of production. That workers would migrate between the pre-capitalist Bantustans as they became, 
the reserves that they are otherwise don't would mo would be would migrate between the reserves and the towns, often the mines. And these were single workers that were migrating. And the idea behind the cheap labor power is the Marxist idea that the wage is what reproduces not just the single worker, but the family, the maintenance and renewal of the labor force. That meant that renewal processes were going on in the rural areas, which in a sense were subsidizing cheap labor power of single workers, so long as there was this migrant labor system. And the whole apparatus of segregation and apartheid, the apparatus of the state was geared to reproducing that migrant labor system, controlling the social mobility and the geographical mobility of black workers. And so in this view, in this view, the racial order was contributing to a process of accumulation through the creation of cheap labor power. These two perspectives are not necessarily antagonistic, but they actually did lead to very different sets of questions and historiographies of South Africa. Enter Cedric Robinson. Okay, I'm not here. Okay. I don't know. Has anybody, has anybody read Black Marxism? Making of the few of you. Well, he, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, the making of a Black radical tradition, um, has become a canonical work in Black studies. And there's no way of avoiding it if one isn't going to engage in critical race theory. What does Robinson do in this also thick book, published in 1983 and rediscovered in the last 10 or 15 years? Um, what does one find there? Cedric Robinson, Cedric Robinson says, the idea of racial capitalism was one that was developed in South Africa, a very peculiar society as we know today. But Frederick Robinson argues that that concept of racial capitalism, and the book doesn't have a lot to say about racial capitalism, by the way. Yeah, I see people are ready to look, everybody look, where is it, where is it? 600 pages later, uh, oh, it's not here. Okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, there's still the claim is that, there's still the claim is that we can look at the racial order of the world through the lens of South African apartheid, that racial capitalism can be projected back into history so that racism predates capitalism and that racism drives capitalism, and the response is the black radical tradition, which he sees as the resistive movement of people of color to the racial order. And that black radical tradition, he controversially claims, is autonomous from the capitalism itself and from Western civilization. It is an autonomous tradition that develops in response to racism. Yeah. So he wants to project what he sees, what he reads about, and I'm not sure what he did read about in the 1980s, but he projects that onto the global canvas. Yeah. So here we have, and then, now today, sociologists in South Africa and elsewhere say, what's going on here? They do not recognize the concept of racial capitalism as Robinson develops it. And he essentially uses black radical tradition as an alternative to Marxism, yet 
It is clear to all that the studies of South Africa in this tradition, this historiographical tradition associated with people like Wolpe and Simons and Simons, was of a Marxist vintage. I don't think people would say otherwise. Yes, so there, racial capitalism is now traveling the world, and everybody is seeing racial capitalism everywhere. But we have to be aware of the assumptions and claims that Robinson makes, namely, racial capitalism is a capitalism that is driven by the existing racial orders. Now, there are lots of criticisms of this argument. I want to just emphasize here this idea of the ways in which theories travel and they get misconstrued and critiqued. And actually, there, there's articles by Marcel Perret and Zach Levinson who have actually sort of tried to engage Robinson's ideas and show, in fact, the real history of the concept of racial capitalism in South Africa. All right, so where does Du Bois enter the story? Well, Du Bois writes this book, Black Reconstruction, in 1935. Black Reconstruction in America. And Robinson says that that book is, exemplifies the Black radical tradition. That if you look at the text, says Robinson, and this is his interpretation of the text, there is no vanguard party when the workers strike, and we'll talk about that, and that we talked about it a little bit last time, the general strike, there's no vanguard party, and it's a revolt of peasants, he says. This is his reading of Du Bois. And there is no analysis that you'd expect if it were Marxist of the contradiction between the forces and relations of production that lead to the formation of a working class that will be revolutionary. So, so Robinson interprets Black Reconstruction as part of the Black radical tradition. Well, as I'm going to suggest today, Robinson's argument rests upon, rests upon two problematic claims. First, his interpretation of what Du Bois writes. I think from what I said even last time, one has to be skeptical of the idea that Du Bois thought of the enslaved as peasants. Uh -uh. It's not clear that at all if he's talking about white workers, black workers, planters, and so forth, as we will see later on. So it has a problematic interpretation of Black Reconstruction, but he also has a narrow vision of Marxism, does not see Marxism as an evolving tradition uh, of thought and political engagement. So what I want to do is therefore to examine carefully, because my argument in the end is going to be that is not that Black Reconstruction was the turning point to Black to the Black radical tradition, as Robinson says, but actually the Black radical tradition can be found more likely in the early works of Du Bois, and it's those works that then give rise to Marxism that then never disappears from Du Bois's writings. And I want to do that in relationship to race, class, and capitalism. Now, lucky, shoot, shoot, shoot. Okay, done all that. We've done a lot. Okay, I got 20 minutes. <laughs> um, there it is. This is the, and I've, and I've now substituted um, uh, commentators uh, on uh, around this issue of race, class, and capitalism. I've introduced two other commentators, and Satin and Verdi. Um, as well as Cedric Robinson. So this is my picture. So 
Nancy Fraser takes the accumulation perspective on what I'm calling racialized capitalism, not to get confused with Robinson's racial capitalism. And what she argues is that the capitalist mode of production, the capitalist mode of production, mode of exploitation, always depends upon what Marx called the primitive accumulation. But it's not just at the beginning of capitalism, but it continues an argument made by Luxembourg and David Harvey and many others, that there is a mode of exploitation, capitalist exploitation that depends upon a mode of expropriation and that continues. And she makes the claim. You know, she's a philosopher. She can make all sorts of claims that empirically are uh, not so sure, but makes the claim that actually racial minorities are associated with the mode of expropriation, whereas the dominant racial categories with some, uh, uh, with, with well, obviously with some members of the dominated race, um, they are exploited. It is the workers who are exploited who are the dominant race as opposed to those who are involved and subject to expropriation, as of course in the reserves of South Africa is a prime example, but she's making a very general claim that we can map races onto this model here. This stands for black, and I guess this stands for white, very crudely put. Yeah. That's the accumulation, the idea of generating not only cheap labor power, but of course, natural resources um, and other features that upon which the capitalist mode of production depends. And then I'm using Sutton and Verdi. I particularly like his arguments about the history of the black, white labor split in, in the United States and how it gets um, projected elsewhere in the world. Um, he, he talks about the class struggle perspective and the centrality of the division between black and white workers as undermining class solidarity. Yeah, as opposed to racial capitalism, uh, which Cedric Robinson um, has sort of pioneered. And I think his ideas have a great appeal to many. The primacy of race is really what it's all about. Um, but I'm going to try and suggest that Du Bois, I'm not a historian, Du Bois is over here. Mm. All right. Now, I'm going to give you, as you may have gathered, I like single slides that sort of expand. So that's what I'm going to give you today. Yes. Okay, might I use this thing? Yeah, does it work? Beautiful. I'm going to start at the beginning. Philadelphia, Negro. Not actually at the beginning. I could have started with writings on the suppression of the slave trade, but I will start with the Philadelphia Negro. And if you read that book, and I have it here, it is, it is a thick book. It is a brilliant case study of the Seventh Ward in Philadelphia. And if you just look at the contents, you know, the problem, the Negro problem of Philadelphia, the Negro in Philadelphia, 1638 to 1820. That's what the Chicago School never really did. History of the communities they study. He is, after all, a historian, so not surprisingly, he gives a history of the community. The Negro in Philadelphia, 1820 to 1896. This, then chapter five, the size, age, and sex of the Negro population, the city for a century, the seventh war, da, 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 da. chapter six, conjugal condition, seven, sources of the Negro population, chapter eight, education and illiteracy, occupation of Negroes, and so on and so forth. Um, yes. Yes, and in the end, chapter 18, it's, well, no, let me give you a sense of the Negro family, the African-American criminal, pauperism and alcoholism, the environment of the African-American, the contact of races, the intermarriage of races, 
African-American suffrage, and a final word. And the last two sections are the duty of African-Americans and the duty of whites. Yeah. If you look in this book, you will see that there is a notion of stratification within the Seventh Ward, and it is a Strauss of a stratification that we would now call socioeconomic status, and he has four strata. He has the established African Americans with steady income, relatively, relatively, relatively prosperous, might associate with a talented tenth. Then he has a stable working class, an unstable working class, and then the submerged tenth. And that's amongst the submerged tenth that he identified what we would today call the pathologies of the pathologies of life amongst the black African American community. We don't use that vocabulary, but it's very much in his vision. This may look, and I will make more of that next, whatever it is, next Monday, um, but he is doing something very radical because he is showing how African-Americans are responding to the environment in which they live and the social conditions under which they live and the economic opportunities which they face. But his stratification is not class, it's more like Weberian status, SES, and what is important is income and education, to some extent house ownership. Um, but it is not a class analysis, it's a stratification, Eric would appreciate this, it's a stratification. It's a con it, is, it, it doesn't talk about relations to the means of production. Far from it, he has no conception of that vocabulary at all. So we have here race and status. And no mention of capitalism. The best you can get out of it is modernity. Hmm. Now, now we come to the souls of black folk. Now this is, uh, this is, once you get into the works of Du Bois, you have to, Rec, you, 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 you have an ever-growing appreciation of this little book, The Souls of Black Folk. It is, a, it is a really remarkable book of beautiful essays. Many of the essays are about the importance of education. Um, other essays are about the experience of African Americans in the rural areas of Tennessee and Georgia. Um, and he has some very moving chapters, the loss of his first child, and he poses the question, examines the question, whether it was, whether it was something that was destined to happen, that he knew that his child would have to face and enter into a racialized world. Um, and wonders whether really life is worth it in such a world. He never loses that hope that it might be worth it, but nevertheless poses the question vis-a-vis -vis his own child that he loses at the age of two. Talks quite a bit about religion and the importance of religion in African-American life. And he has this, oh gosh, he has this wonderful essay on the coming of John. This is a story of two Johns, white John, the black John. You know the job, you know that one? Yeah, you know, so many so many people were talking about uh, the comet last time. This is, this is, this is, even, this is, deeper. This is more profound. This is white John, black John, they're playmates. They don't recognize as youngsters, as children, the racial barriers, much as his own childhood didn't. They go off to college, both of them. One goes to Princeton, 
he happened to have been the son of the judge in the town. And the other goes off to an unnamed university. I suppose one could figure it out, but anyway, it doesn't have a name. And they meet in rather unfortunate circumstances in the north because the Black John is very interested in music and goes to the concert where Wagner has been played, which, of course, by the way, is Du Bois' favorite composer. Mm -hmm. Black John doesn't realize that this is whites only, sits down next to, happens to accidentally sit down next to White John. And White John looks around doesn't recognize Black John and calls somebody to oust him from. Okay. Next we hit, well, it's a long, it's a longish story, but the next significant moment is two Johns come back to their hometown and White John is very disgruntled about living there and the judge wants him to, wants his son to succeed him. Black John is at loss too. Neither really are comfortable having been in the north in this, in the southern town. And the story ends as White John sexually harasses, perhaps rapes, the sister of Black John. And the story ends with Black John killing White John. And the very last lines are Black John imagining what it's going to be like to be lynched. It's an extraordinary moving story about the different patterns of race relations, racial race relations in the North and in the South. And how, as one grows up also, the relations among people change. Anyway, that is a fictitious story, but one in which captures for Du Bois that experience of being black, which is really so different from the Philadelphia Negro. Now, there is not much about class as we would know it today in the souls of black folk, except for one essay, which is a story, which is an account, actually. This, he had published a long report. It was, it, it was solicited by the State Bureau of Labor and Labor Statistics. And then when they read it, they decided not to publish it. When he wanted the manuscript back, they said they'd lost it. But anyway, he tells the story of the dictatorship, the dictatorship of the debt and amongst sharecroppers. And in that account, that's, it's called the quest. So, oops. Okay. Quest of Golden Fleece. Anyway, in that story, there is a clear class stratification, absentee landowners, sharecroppers with access to a wage economy, then there are sharecroppers that have money, have money that are able to give them more flexibility and actually begin to own some land. So there are, and then there are the sharecroppers who have nothing, the majority. But it is about the relations to the means of production. This is class. Now we have race and class. One essay in this book, but no mention really of capitalism. There are capitalists, and in this case, absentee landowners. You know, I don't know what's wrong with that clock. It really goes very fast. <laughs> this is a punishment. Well, the trouble with this talk is that I did, this was a talk that was now, that was a course, a semester <laughs> course, graduate course, which I'm contracting, but I will continue. I will continue and perhaps I'll do this in 10 minutes. So here we are, here we are, here we are. Um, yes, all right. So I just want to emphasize that the Philadelphia Negro, um, or should I say the souls of black folk is already a break 
from the Philadelphia Negro, but the project is the same. The project is to convince whites that actually blacks are human beings, only the strategy is very different. Here we have professional science, and here we have the experiential narratives and accounts ethnographic in character. Okay, this is the, what Althusser and others would call the epistemological break. This is the root. Many sociologists are stuck over here. But anyway, I am telling you that you should be reading Dark Water. It's a beauty. You can see how thin it is. Very thin, very beautiful. Okay. How we have racialized capitalism. Racialized capitalism. I say racialized capitalism because under that vision, it is capitalism driving race rather than race driving capitalism, which is racial capitalism. Dark Water, 1920. There are beautiful essays in here, not least the essay on the comet, um, Damnation of Women, a magnificent vision of democracy, very different to the vision he has in the Philadelphia Negro, not based on votes, but what he says, what he says is called the ruling of men. He says that we have to include everybody in democracy because everybody's experience should be included. It's the experience of different groups that is so crucial. Yeah. Anyway, I want to concentrate on two essays. White folk, which you all have to read if you're interested in boys, you're interested in fact studies, in race, and you will see why when you read it, it's an extraordinary essay about white supremacy, about um, imperialism, and he asks, why is it that the West has got such a superior culture? Note, he does not deny the superiority of Western, of Western civilization, but why? Because they have expropriated all the best from others. That's imperialism. Yes. So yes, and of course, that involves violence. And of course, yeah, he has no truck with those sociologists, whether they are Marx or Weber, who say that so capitalism reproduces itself of itself without violence. No violence it continues through the history of capitalism. Anyway, you, that's the souls of white folk. And then there is a work of wealth, and that is the race right of East St. Louis, and the conflagration that emerges around World War I when there is white capital, white labor, black labor, the so-called segregated split labor market. But what happens during World War I, the immigration from Europe is cut off. There is an expansion of industry. So where is the new labor to come from? From the South. And this terrifies white workers who are threatened and thus to the race right of East St. Louis. Yes. And this is, uh, Du Bois is always trying to see whether in fact and under what conditions black and white workers will solidify, become united. And he sees that in this situation, there was no hope. There was little hope, except at certain moments, the unskilled blacks and unskilled whites did begin to organize themselves. Whew. Right. Now we get to, oh, Black Reconstruction. Yeah, that's right. This is a thick book. Let me just show it to you. <laughs> this is thick, but it's even worse. Look at the pages. The print is small, and the pages are big. <laughs> yeah. We are how many people really read them in the middle stuff. Where, hey, don't, don't, don't get distracted. Black Reconstruction, segregated. All right. So what we have here is, first of all, a global picture in which he talks about the Industrial Revolution in England generating the demand for cotton, which then intensifies what? Intensifies the slavery in the South. It was dying away, according to Du Bois, but then it was replenished and intensified in response to the demand for cotton in Europe. Of course, there is the split labor market here too. Um, white workers 
We're not working on the plantations. They're set as monitors, as supervisors, um, as a patrols, um, white workers, and some independent uh, farming, limited, but some. And they also had certain petty bourgeois trading op opportunities largely denied to blacks who were located on the plantations. Okay. So that's in the South, but we also have a split labor market in the North, which I have just described. And essentially it is white capital, white workers, in skilled workers in particular, but also unskilled workers coming from Europe themselves. Why are they coming from Europe? Du Bois describes the dispossession that is taking place as capitalism develops, as capitalism develops in Europe. So the Irish and Germans are dispossessed from access to land. They migrate, some of them migrate to the United States. Yes. So before we get there, let me tell the story then what happens is, as I described very briefly last time, is that here he's already talking about modes of production, though he never uses that language, but he, he's interested in the dynamics of slavery. And what he argues is that slavery to expand has to expand geographically as it destroys the soils upon which it rests and also has to expand for labor supplies. So there's something inherently expansionist about slavery, a point that Weber makes and Marx makes. So he actually gives it much more concrete meaning. So the expansion of slavery threatens, threatens what? The wage labor system in the North. And this for Du Bois is the actual tension that is the source of the Civil War. Yeah. And then in the actual development of the Civil War, it looks as if the Northern armies, because they have difficulty recruiting troops, they can recruit them on the grounds of some sort of patriotism, defense of the Union, but they're not very enthusiastic about the elimination of slavery. Um, and so as time goes on, they become ever more alienated from the war itself. And at this very moment, as the Northern armies are moving around the South, they draw in from the, uh, from the 4 million enslaved population, a half a million actually defect. And of those, about 300,000 become actual troops for the Northern army and dedicated troops they were too. This is what Du Bois calls the general strike. And they are so motivated because this is their possibility of what? of liberation, of emancipation, as of course declared in the Emancipation Declaration of 1863, which further gives them encouragement, and they think that God is on our side. Yes. The Lord cometh, what's that chapter called? The coming of the Lord. Yes. So they have a sort of religious fervor about this is their chance, the emancipation, yes. All right, oops, always that one comes up, funny. Um, yeah, so, and then of course the reconstruction is really the progress of, after the North wins the war, we have reconstruction and reconstruction brings in the, the, the Freedmen's Bureau, which is basically the government of the North in the South, advancing the interests of African-Americans in law courts, advancing them in just the protection of enfranchisement, uh, the advancement of education and in health and welfare. Um, so there is a genuine, a genuine move towards an interracial democracy. Yeah. Right. Um, well, that lasts from 1865 to 1876-77, sort of petering out as the, as the North becomes less and less interested in supporting the Freedmen's Bureau, supporting it militarily against the rising, um, the rising insurgency of white workers and... Um, and, 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 uh, and uh, ...terrorist organizations like the KKK. 
So there was this fatal election of 1876, um, which in the end brings Rutherford Hayes to be president, um, but on, only on the grounds uh, of a commitment that uh, he's, he's Republican, only on the grounds of a commitment for the withdrawal of the North from the South. And there is indeed a withdrawal of the North from the South. And Du Bois describes this as the counter-revolution of property, that capitalists have no longer the same interests in the South as they did before, having, having eliminated slavery, they were prepared to then allow the former slave owners to the former plant planters to actually take over the South. Yeah, and reconstruction and into back towards slavery, um, as Du Bois formulates one well, next to the last chapter, and then, and then, we have Jim Crow, and we have the, 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 some of the, the very famous sentence, a very famous sentence that Du Bois writes about the, the public and psychological wage that whites have. The whites are convinced to go along with the planters because they will have the psychological, the psychological affirmation from being superior, not at the bottom of the hierarchy, but more, but more, but more important, the public wage that they have access to education, to welfare, to politics, um, is denied to blacks. So the public wage is important. Anyway, that is, that's briefly the story of 1960, 1935. And Du Bois writes this in a period of the New Deal and he sees, of course, in the New Deal that, yes, there is really some, he, he doesn't call it a revolution, but there is a real transformation, so, social reconstruction, but the blacks are left out. At this point, he despairs of the NAACP's, NAACP's policy of integration, pursuing legal resource, recourses, and, and, as I said last time, he develops the idea of, he calls it, building a nation within a nation, Negro nation, to build an economy that is sort of semi-autonomous from the wider economy, the cooperative commonwealth, he calls it. He, and it's, it's, it's written in detail in Dusk of Dawn. And what, what is so central to the analysis of Dusk and Dawn is that he recognizes the depth of racism the depths of racism, the irrationality, you can't, it is not this, just people who are badly meaning or ignorant or have material interests, it goes much deeper. And as I said last time, he refers to the importance of the writings of Freud, but he never actually delves into the writings of Freud, as far as I know, except in his... <laughs> okay, so that's the Dusk of Dawn, it's the sort of autobiographical uh, text. And we are moving towards the end. You see, in the souls of white folk, imperialism is the key to the understanding of the global order. And, but he has two imperialisms. One imperialism is based on the importation of the enslaved, and the other imperialism is when slavery is ended and capital moves from the West to the third world, as we used to call it, but specifically to Africa, and constitutes a new form of labor repressive regime around the extraction of natural resources, um, and also at the same time creates a market for excess goods from the North the United States. Yes, and that, those, those ideas um, are developed in these two books, written in 1947 and 45. The world in Africa tends to talk about the first stage of imperialism, the history of imperialism, um, um, in, 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 in the organization of the slave trade and in the constitution of slavery. South. And the second book, Color and Democracy, is much more about the anti-colonial project um, after the Second World War. 
Um, and he's arguing in that book that there will be no democracy anywhere so long as there is imperialism. And he talks about actually, and has talked on previous occasions too, about what he calls democratic despotism. Um, and so he's recognizing that the future of democracy in the United States or in Western countries depends upon the ending of imperialism. Yeah. So that's the end of my picture, you'll be pleased to know. But there is more. In 1947, he's got another, he's got another 20, 17 years to live, seven, 16 years to live. In that period, he is becoming ever more um, ever more critical of the United States and its role in the world as an imperial power. And he writes, I believe, almost like Lenin in Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, though we have no evidence that he had read Lenin, but I can't believe that he hasn't read Lenin. He's, he sometimes doesn't really cite, oh, he, well, not sometimes, he doesn't really <laughs> cite where he's getting his ideas from. That's, of course, the role of the historian to figure this out. Of course, people don't have to have read Lenin because, of course, the people he is mixing with have Lenin internalized. Um, so anyway, he, he, he has a simultaneous, he, has a, he, he begins to have a, a vision of capitalism versus communism, not surprisingly, and he's no, he has, he, he, he's no, he has no doubt about where he stands in that. And he writes this book, this is never published, I talked about last time, uh, America and Russia. In Russia compared, in which he so sort of eulogizes the wonders of the Soviet Union, as is expressed in the Marxist Leninist ideology, and the, he critiques the way he sees the United States as a merging form of monopoly capitalism combined with an imperial. It's not that original, but it's very significant that he comes to this conclusion. Um, and then, of course, he gets very enamored by China as well as the Soviet Union, and then tells Africa, yeah, they must learn from China. Yes, all right, all right. That's my picture. Let me just say what we're supposed to have learned today. Yeah. First, critical engagement. Ideas as the product of external engagement in a changing world combined with an internal reflexivity. The result is, the result is it's very difficult to extract simply theory from Du Bois because he is so sensitive to the changing, his, his role in a changing world. We, as sociologists, as academics, um, have to work hard in taking his ideas and making them uh, turning them into a more generalizable theoretical framework. I think this is important because if we want to learn from Du Bois, we first have to situate Du Bois in his historical context and then extract from that an understanding of what we can learn in the present. And that process will require theoretical work. Now look, Weber and Durkheim have had a century or more of interpretation, so give the guy a chance, but we have to work. We have to work. It's not just, you can't just accept. So if this is a great man, we have to do more. We have to work with him. And he, in a sense, his, his work is, you know this fellow? Sociology lies at the intersection of biography and history. Who, who said that? Mills, very good. So you write Mills. Yes. <laughs> oh, that was only a guess. Okay. Yeah, right. We need the sociological imagination. Every graduate student has to read that. It's a Wisconsin alum. Hmm? Wisconsin alum. That is a Wisconsin alum? No less. No less. Yes, anyway. So let's go move on here. Third, race, class, and capitalism is an evolving analysis in Du Bois's work. It moves towards Marxism, and once it arrives at Marxism, it never leaves Marxism, however, however, however problematic and orthodox that Marxism may appear. 
Yes. And you also see something fascinating. As soon as he becomes a sociologist, he starts very micro. The, the analysis in, of Philadelphia that there's a case study of a community. And then something similar with the souls of black folk. But once you get to 1920 and Dark Water, he's suddenly expanded. Well, he's been editor of the practice. He's building a whole new world around it. Yeah, yeah. Two dimensions of racialized capitalism. I believe both of these dimensions can be found in Du Bois, both a project of accumulation, exploitation, and expropriation in the souls of white folk, and a split, or I better say, segregated labor market that's to be found in the of work and wealth, it's right in St. St. Louis. So is there a black tragical tradition in Du Bois? Well, I mistimed things again. Uh, I was going to actually tell you en route, that this is the best, probably one of the best places to look for the black radical tradition. Here, he is actually um, in the souls of black folks, really talking about the spirituality of African Americans that they inherited from Africa. And he, he's, 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 he's talking about so sort of the religious aspect, and he's talking about the the humanity of African Americans as he finds it in the rural areas. The, the, well, what else? That's something, perhaps I'm overstretching the point. Perhaps there isn't a lot here. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Sorrow songs, I suppose, are the other of the songs that the African Americans would sing on the plantations. But there's a sort of feeling that he's trying to actually begin to begin to excavate, to begin to excavate a vision of Africanness and essentialism, which becomes even clearer when he writes in 1915 The Negro. It's a thin book, but it is first attempt to unveil the history of Africa from an African perspective or an African-American perspective. So I think if there is a black radical tradition in Du Bois, it's likely to be found in his early writings, um, The Dark Princess, which I haven't talked about, another novel which has a sort of romantic vision of the colored races of the world. Um, anyway, I think that that is where, whereas I think it's indisputable. Wow, saying that in the Avon's right center, indisputable. Anyway, yeah, it's indisputable that Black Reconstruction is a Marxist analysis that actually borrows from many of the ideas in Marx and Engels' own writings on the Civil War in America. Yes. And so it seems to me a better argument that Robinson could make is Du Bois starts with the black radical tradition and then moves to Marxism. So this is sort of it's the immature Du Bois as opposed to the mature Du Bois. Yeah. Um, and what happens after, once Marxism has arrived at in Black Reconstruction, it really does, in a sense, deepen and inform his understanding of the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, now it's, it's fascinating that Robinson doesn't really delve into the other writings of Du Bois. He just focuses on Black Reconstruction. So if he wanted to see a movement, he should be looking what happens before and after. Reconstruction after 1935. But anyway, he doesn't do that. And anyway, finally, therefore, what alternatives are there to black recons black radical tradition? Now, I'm not denying that you can extract and you can present black radical tradition in all sorts of ways. And if you want, you can distort the ways in which um, distort, I think, or reinterpret the ways in which Du Bois right, and try and make a case that he's really talking about peasants rather than workers. All right, I, that's okay. That's the wonders of, 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 of Du Bois is that many traditions probably can come out of it. But I'm not so interested in the black radical tradition, though. I'm more interested, and that's what the next two, the next two, the next two lectures will be about. One will be about 
What does Du Bois mean for sociology? What does it mean to reconstruct sociology with Du Bois? And the last one is how to think about the construction of black Marxism. So one walks on two legs. Um, that's the only way I can balance. I can think about sociology and Marxism. And Du Bois supplies all sorts of important ideas of how we can rethink sociology and Marxism. So on that note, I will end. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first, we have uh, some questions from Howard Wynan um, at UC. Hi, Howard. Uh, Howard writes, Michael, we appreciate your wonderful breadth and depth. Two questions about the doctor. One, why was he suspicious of the civil rights movement in the late 50s and on? And was it all the repressive moments, uh, McCarthyism, et cetera? And two, why was he such a Stalinist in his later communism? Was that strategic or something else? Oh, gosh. Thank you, Howie. Okay, cyber rights in the 1950s. I don't think that's actually true. So we could have a discussion. I mean, he was, um, he, he, he became quite close to a radical group in the South, a civil rights group, it was called the Southern Congress of something, something. I've forgotten the exact, but anyway, so he was in, that was one of his deep engagements. Um, I think that he, he became, as a result of, I talked about last time, he was indicted um, as being a foreign, an undeclared agent of a foreign principle for his peace activism. And he, at that time, became ever more, um, ever more concerned about his popularity being lost um, amongst his colleagues, but particularly middle-class African-Americans, who he saw as no longer being responsive to the interests of the African-American population as a whole, um, and more to their class interests. And I don't know, perhaps, how you're suggesting that, that his distanciation from civil rights was a reflection of um, his distancing from middle class African Americans. But I don't, I think that it was a very complex period in the 1950s. He was very much isolated because his passport was denied. I, he, was, he was ever more moving in circles um, that were communist, particularly through the connections of his second wife, Shirley Graham. And I think increasingly African Americans were suspicious of him, um, are suspicious of him because of his leftist politics. Which brings me to the question of Stalin. Yeah. I wish I had time to read to you two pages from his final autobiography, where he talks about Paul Robeson and describes why it was that Paul Robeson and other African Americans were so devoted to the Soviet Union. And I talked about that last time, but you have to understand, it seems to me, where he is coming from. He's coming from the land of lynching. He's coming from a, from a, a world which has denied him access to resources, to audiences that he, he true, he rightfully believed he should have had access to. It was the, I don't have to go into the details in this room of the racial oppression African Americans in general experience, but he particularly felt them because he clearly understood himself as an outstanding intellectual that was despised by the white population. That's what, that's, he, has, he has some very moving passages saying, if I were white, I would just be a conformist sociologist. But race led me down a very different path. And so you can have, so in the Soviet Union, Heinz will tell us all about that. In the Soviet Union, you know, when Bo Du Bois, Du Bois arrives in the Soviet Union, the red carpet is out. I mean, he's looked after. He's treated as an individual. He's treated as a serious intellectual. He's seen as a representative of his people. So, Du Bois, in my view, 
that. You know, from our standpoint, we would call this a blind spot. We can't understand why he might have embraced the Soviet Union. And of course, Howie, at the end of your, your, your question, you say, was this just strategic? Now, of course, there was a strategic moment and it became increasingly important because in, defi in, in, fighting, in fighting for peace, he was allying himself with the Soviet Union. It was a strategic move. And same with China. He perhaps fell into the fallacy, the enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Tricky, tricky, gives him a lot of trouble. He endorsed Japanese imperialism because he thought it was an alternative to U.S. Western imperialism. But yeah, problematic. But he shifts, he changes his mind, he thinks about it. Continue, but he never rethinks his allegiance to the Soviet Union. <laughs> You're my best, Howie. <laughs> Anyone in the room have a question? I, it's a comment more than a question. He, did, he may have had a romant, I mean, I knew people, I know people who had that romanticism about the Soviet Union, but he did move to Ghana, not to the Soviet Union. So I think, I, I mean, I think you're really right about the race part of driving a lot. Yes, no, you're, um, no he, 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 he moved to Ghana because he was trying to do at the end of his life, right? Try to create this Encyclopedia Africana. And Nkrumah said to him, we'll give you the resources to do that and you'll be in Africa. He's never been, he'd be in Africa in 1923, which he himself will admit was a bit of a disaster because he was deluded about the, he was deluded about African Americans running running Liberia, somehow that is incompatible with some colonialism. But it's, so he understood that he had made a mistake there. And he understood that his, his pa pa paternalistic African-American perspective on Africa was suspect as, as he saw these leaders rising up across Africa. And he wanted to be, yes, in Africa, that was his home. Read how he talks about his first time arrival in Africa in 1923. Coming home is lyrical. I mean, it's, it's his, it's... End of sentence. <laughs> Yes. So yes, I think that's but I think it's significant. You're right. I think it's significant that he go to Ghana rather than to Moscow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had a question about the two uh takes on racialized capitalism. So there was the accumulation view, the class struggle view. Uh -huh. And um I was curious, I guess, about because you did categorize two texts, but I was wondering where you would put Black Reconstruction uh, between those two. Um, I also had a question about, so the, I think the two biggest concepts I hear sociologists use from Du Bois are, one you mentioned today, the public and psychological wage um, from Black Reconstruction. The other is double consciousness yeah. from um, Souls of Black Folk. Yeah. And I'm wondering uh, if double consciousness sort of fits in any way in that sort of uh, either of those two visions of racialized capitalism or approaches to racialized capitalism, or if that's a different track. And I guess, finally, uh, you mentioned that in Dusk of Dawn, he uh, sort of goes back to talking about the sort of psychological depths of racism, which also strikes me like it could be interpreted as a kind of black radical tradition idea, uh, as opposed to a, a racialized capitalism idea. But I wonder if if there is some way to, t to talk about the sort of psychological aspect in either the, the sort of accumulation approach to racialized capitalism or the class struggle approach to racialized capitalism. So that's one question. I actually have a second but that I wanted to ask last time, and you can choose, you can choose either one, because I know we don't have a lot of time, so whichever one's your favorite. But uh, the, the other was, I just was curious what, just generally what you think accounts for the sort of explosion and interest in Du Bois in sociology now. Or is it, is it just that Alden Morris wrote a great book? Or is there sort of more to this sort of turn to Du Bois? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I say I want to try and let's see, let me do, do this punctually. Um, you know, the, the, the first question, they're, they're all great questions. Um, black reconstruction. 
I think it splits the story. It's, it, I, as, as the picture I put on the board was of two segregated labor markets. It's that vision um, rather than capital accumulation vision that I see operative. And you can find exceptions, but you're asking for my general take is, and I was surprised to find that. Um, I think actually you can take this, the three actors themselves, homogenized, of course, and he, he, but white capital, white labor, and black labor. And you can see throughout his writings how they are always playing with one another, but differently in different contexts. And I think that that's, it's, it may be the underlying structure of his thinking rather than the accumulation idea. Um, so that's, I, that's my first thing. Double content, I was going to read about double content. It's, it's really interesting because the, the, the break, if there is a break, the break between Philadelphia Negro and the souls of black folk is, is a very significant one because in the souls of black folk, yes, he talks about the double consciousness, the two souls, the African and the American soul competing with one another. And they are indeed competing in Du Bois's life all the time in different ways. But that, that, that commentary there is that allows him to actually talk, be very critical of the American ideology that he has embraced in the Philadelphia Negro. I think that double consciousness um, that that the Americanism and the, and the blackness are in conflict because they are two sides of a, 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 of a form of domination, which is not really central to the arguments in Philadelphia Negro. Yes. But yes, that, that we could, a lot more could be said about that. Yeah, and I think double consciousness can actually be traced into others of the writing, but particularly Dusk of Dawn, particularly Dusk of Dawn, which is, again, autobiographical. How does one fit it into these more structural accounts? That's an interesting question, which I will not answer. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes, and yes, I think you're right. Probably, well, the irrationality of racism could be made to fit into the Black radical tradition. Yes, yes. I think that's right. And the distinct, the, the, yes, I think that's right. Um, yes, that was a good answer. Right, <laughs> yes. Uh, as, for, yeah, as for sociology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Sociology doesn't have many changes, but there is, it's, it's it, it, you know, it, the canon in sociology, as many of you may know, began with a fellow called Al Sarkar Parsons, a brilliant theorist, who I'm sure was in this room sometime, um, famous for a book, Structure of Social Action, we brought together the ideas of Weber, Durkheim, Marshall, and Pareto to a single notion of the voluntaristic theory of action. And so the canon changes. Canon changes. And he, Parsons himself, dropped Marshall and Pareto once he realized that he didn't have to convince the economists that sociologists were, were the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and then, of course, you have the social movements of the 60s that brings in Marx. So we have Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. But Weber and Durkheim still hang around. And what's a great thing, if it's not convergence theory, as, to, as Parsons had, and I'm going to talk about this on Monday, but now we have a plural plurality of paradigms, if you will, around these canonical figures in sociology. So the question is, well, that's a long time ago, 60s, 70s, apparently. I mean, I was, it was just yesterday for me, but for most people, it's the it's a, it's a last century, right? <laughs> yeah, I go. Yes. Um, it's about time something changed. Um, so the question is, what has happened? I mean, yeah, I mean, is it, is it, the intensification of the sensitivity and acknowledgement of the history of racism in this country that is now at least widely accepted in sociology. Uh, and, you know, it's what, I think it's what is interesting to compare it with feminism. 
why feminism was on the as, as continues to be on the outside rather than included, but there is a real move to canonize Du Bois, but not so much, in my view, to canonize feminism. Feminism remained out as a critic, and yet feminism actually spread through the whole discipline. The focus on gender and gender domination. And we'll see what happens with race, but I think that also is spreading across subdisciplines. Can't talk about anything without talking about race, gender, and now, of course, we forget about class. Um, but yes, no, I think that's an interesting question. I don't have a really interesting answer. Um, but it's certainly happening, but everywhere. I mean, how many people are reading Du Bois around here? Silence. Ah, somebody said that M Mustafa, how do you read the comet? Yeah. And the story of the two jots. Oh, oh, really? Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, 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 good. Well, that's, well, that's, well, so why was he doing that? Why was he picking on fiction? You might have to ask him. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 you can imagine him. You, you, you've had a whole course from him. I don't know. It was easier to see what Du Bois was saying through his fiction than through his nonfiction. Yeah. It's also shorter. Shorter. <laughs> yeah. Certainly is. Dang. I Oh, this is an undergraduate. No, I mean, they're, they're busy. So reading all of Black Reconstruction would be. No, no, I'm just talking about the, the souls of Black folk. It's a gen. A bunch of things yeah. that we, we, it just so happens. Yeah, that. well, you see, this is the whole thing, teaching sociological theory. You read a whole bunch of things in one week. Ah, oh, no, that doesn't work. Yeah, you know, it just means that you have to spend a whole year reading Du Bois. That you have to have a, at least a course. And, you know, it, it, but anyway, yes, yes, that's interesting. Um, but I, anyway, there are no courses on Du Bois here. Oh, okay. Most There's... of us teach us one. Ah. Yes. Yeah, he's teaching one next semester. Yeah. Most of us. Oh, pity he's not here. <laughs> um, then he could tell us. But yes, all right, fine. So if most of us teach here, it must be a thing. Right, so yeah. Um, <laughs> we can have a good conversation about most of that in his absence. But anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah. But there are many departments where this hasn't caught on. I'm the first person to teach a course on Du Bois. Old white guy has to teach a course in English into the bargain. Um, teaching a course on Du Bois. Yeah. Well, I was lucky there were some students there. Um, you know, I don't have the legitimacy to be doing this. And it's amazing that there are so many people that come here to listen to me. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, all right. So I wanted to um, pick up on a point that you made about Black Reconstruction, about how it was incontrovertible in this sort of Marxist text. Um, and so recently, your colleague Dylan Riley had a, a short piece in um, the online edition of the Black Review where he, he challenges this, this view. And he says, I mean, he challenges various people, but he says, essentially, um, in this text, Du Bois is a kind of Jeffersonian Democrat. Uh, he's not interested in industrial proletariat, traditional Marxian subjects, privileged subject. Um, his vision of you know, sort of the ideal society is kind of small holding farmers. Um, and I guess I just wonder how you would respond to this very different reading of this text. Wouldn't know how to respond because it doesn't make any sense to me at all. As somebody, a Harvard graduate student, put the whole thing to rest and nobody's even responded further. But that's that's the Jeffersonian idea of of a small holding and small small holding democracy. It's an interesting idea, but what's actually if you read Black Reconstruction, you will see that during the Civil War, once the plantations had been overtaken, so they were they were given over to African Americans who were no longer enslaved, and they organized which was very uh, 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 an important thing for Du Bois, they organized themselves into collectives. And that's always been a theme throughout his writings, that he's always been interested in actually collective production. And that is what he saw. There, you might say there was a prefiguration of a democracy based on smallholders. The problem was, of course, in the end, that land was not redistributed to very many, and so that project couldn't take place. I mean, it is, it is the reality that 
he recognizes very clearly that without the redistribution of land, there will be no interracial democracy uh, in, in the South, in the United States. And so, yeah, he, 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 he laments the fact, um, emphasizes the actual progress that was being made um, against, of course, the Dunning School, which says that Reconstruction was a total catastrophe because you let African Americans participate. He was trying to show how they were building up an interracial democracy, but it was not a Jeffersonian small holding democracy that he was actually actually studying. It was what he calls in the chapter on the um, counter revolution of property. He calls it the dictatorship of labor. <laughs> yeah. And it was a dictation of the capital versus dictator. Read that chapter. And I, I, don't, I think that Dylan was just trying to be a provocateur. How unusual for Dylan. How unusual for Dylan. <laughs> Sound like him. <laughs> we have time for one last question. And then I invite everybody in the room to stay for a small reception in honor of Michael Burrowboy. So please, one last question from the floor. I'm wondering where you think the Caribbean Marxist tradition fits in with this concept of racial capitalism or racialized capitalism, because it seems like you can find a lot of the ideas that you describe as either the class struggle or the accumulation perspective in the writings of CLR James or Eric Williams as early as the 30s or 40s. Where do they fit into this lineage? Well, I think Eric Williams, who Later on, Du Bois actually cites as a summary of the triangular relationship between Africa, Europe, Britain, and, and, and the United States. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a big development on Du Bois' early work about the suppression of the slave trade. Um, yeah, I think that that, 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 that is a, a, a more expansive account of the imperialism perspective. Now, C.R. James is always difficult to put in any pigeonhole. Um, he's, he is just, he, there's no limit to this fellow. Um, and his best book is about cricket. And um, so, yes, um, I mean, the, the text to go through is obviously the Black Jacobins. And yes, I don't know how I, I, I think there are more elements of imperialism in black Jacobins than there are in segregated labor markets. Um, and it is, of course, very oriented around Toussaint Louverture. Uh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a book about, in my, these categories, that's a book about imperialism again. Um, yeah, then of course there are people like Stuart Hall who perhaps actually might move more in the direction of his analysis of the UK, more in the direction of a sort of segregated labor market that obviously has everything with Stuart Hall much more complex and um, interesting. Yes, but I will, I will talk, well, I will not talk about that. I mean, I think this is a fascinating question. Suddenly, Caribbean is at the center of the world. I mean, the world of Marxists who are interested in race. Um, I'm going to a conference on Oliver Cromwell Cox in Trinidad. You know, Trinidad has produced Oliver Cromwell Cox, C.L.R. James, George Padmore, Eric Williams. Walter Rodney. No, it's Guinness. Guinness. Sorry. And he went to Jamaica. I don't think he spent much time in Trinidad. But anyway, that's four. But there's a, amazing. And so I think there is now, and of course, the history of slavery is so different there. But, you know, it makes this great because it makes the United States look very peculiar. And that's what we have to do. And Du Bois, I think, probably centered his analysis on the United States. And I think he had America's eccentric view of the world, um, which I probably said last time too. And so I think this is really interesting, this now this focus on so many people on the Caribbean. So yeah, I think this is a very, very exciting development.